Welcome to the summer edition of the Open Educator, the best place to be on a Saturday morning. Thank you for joining us today and for taking the first steps to grow personally and professionally. And I would like to encourage everyone to turn on their camera and to listen with intention. We've created this community as a way to stand shoulder to shoulder virtually and to share a bit about why the entrepreneurship and innovation programs and courses throughout the different programs uh, and majors and, and degrees are important. And we develop students in three main ways. One, of course, to help them start their own business. And we have several alums who have gone on uh, to create businesses, sell businesses, and do wonderful things. But that's a limited view of entrepreneurship. And many of the individuals today know of entrepreneurship and innovation in their own firm, when within a firm, which is often under discussed or under or not as well understood, which is exactly why we take the innovation in Dali course. We know all the famous companies who are innovating, Apple, Amazon, and many of your companies as well. But how to understand the tools and techniques and frameworks that these companies are doing that can apply to our firm, our context, our situation. And that's why we're here and also to learn how to be entrepreneurs or to, to move and push the ball forward of, of innovation within our firms and outside of these legacy thoughts or processes or I guess legacy processes that inhibit us to grow personally, professionally, the firm to grow, et cetera. And lastly, we help students to define careers they define themselves, not what others define for them, like many other the programs do. And we have several students in the MBA program and undergraduate who are absolute gangsters, who have recreated what the idea of a career are, have gained influence on IG, YouTube, taking my classes from Bali, launching their own music career. These are just a taste. So uh, those are the three main pillars of the entrepreneurship and innovation program. And I would suggest that our next guest, who is a USF MBA alum, is a gangster, a pioneer, someone who's always giving back to the community, giving back to USF, and he stands by his word. And this is probably like his fifth time coming to class. So. He has set the bar high for all of you and alums who are going through this program. He has walked in your shoes. He's left a trail of breadcrumbs for you to follow. And he's here today to talk about his journey, uh, his career, and how it could potentially, the, the changes in a career in the MBA program uh, and what can be possible, innovation at his firm. And our next guest will share these experiences and how they applied innovation to his leading tech firm. So please give a warm welcome to senior solutions engineer and team lead at Salesforce, Riley Hitchcock. Riley, thank you again for joining us on this cast on Saturday morning. Maybe you can bring us up to speed what you've been working on and thank you again for being here and where does this find you? Well, my golden retriever seems to want to chime in this morning and participate in the improv activities, but uh, nonetheless, Dr. D, thank you again for having me. It's such a pleasure to come back and try to give back to, to this class, both through my experience, my career, what we're doing at Salesforce. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd like to go ahead and just kind of present now and walk through, you know, the content that I've got. Uh, keep it interactive. If there's questions along the way, this is not death by PowerPoint, the intent. This is a really condensed, maybe eight to 10 minute presentation. Really want to talk to you about what we're doing, the power of innovation from the Salesforce perspective. Dive into how that kind of connects back to innovation through the lens of DALI, and also kind of how we embrace innovation as an organization, both top down and bottom up. So I'm Riley Hitchcock, senior solutions engineer and team lead at Salesforce. And really what a solutions engineer is, the the expert on the product. I work for the core team. So I I'm an expert across all products, really a mile wide and probably about a foot or two deep. And then we have individuals that are solution engineers that are product specific that I tap in as needed. But really our job is to bring the customer and the solution together, map what their, in, their outcomes, their needs, their challenges are to the products and solutions that can help drive their business forward. As a team lead, I also lead some of our younger uh, and newer SCs, ramping them up, getting them involved in the team and the role here at Salesforce. So just a little bit about me, a uh, big thank you. We do this for all of our presentations, all of our customers, your time is valuable. So thank you for participating in this today. It means a lot uh, to be here for both me and to have you here. So about me, undergrad at UF, I'm a go-gator, um, but 
I do not discount the value that my MBA has brought to my life and my career through USF St. Pete. I proudly uh, hail it back here on my wall behind my left shoulder so that everybody can see it on my calls, uh, <clears throat> but wear that badge proudly. Before coming to Salesforce, I spent 10 years in commercial real estate and I'd been introduced to Salesforce back in 2008 for the first time. I was a super user of the tool, uh, worked with our admins, really kind of developed the, the end user experience at a lot of the organizations, but really got to see the power that it had and influenced my role as a salesperson throughout my career uh, in real estate. I made the pivot personally uh, because I love the tool. I was introduced through uh, my wife's best friend. Her dad was at Salesforce at the time. We hit it off, started talking about uh, coming to Salesforce, what Salesforce was like. That was a two-year journey in conversation, a couple, uh, several interviews, several missed opportunities, and then finally uh, was fortunate enough to, to find the right opportunity, the right team, uh, and actually brought to Salesforce on his team back in October 2019. A huge pivot for me, anybody that knows what's going on in the retail real estate world with malls, uh, I could not have been more fortunate to come to this organization before mass layoffs hit due to COVID in this industry, so I feel any of my brethren out there, if you have people in commercial real estate, please have them call me. Uh, it was a massive career pivot and change in my organization. Jen Johnson, I think you just raised your hand as well. Uh, I've got two kids, five and three. Uh, we had one snow day. I think this was uh, early last year, uh, but we took the kids out, got to play. Being in Tampa my whole life, we didn't really see a lot of snow. And then I've got two golden retrievers. You heard one of them chiming in just a bit earlier. So I wanted to take a, take a step back here and really connect the, the innovation that we have and the mindset that we take at Salesforce back to really what's taught in the principle of the innovation and using the lens of DALI. And we're, all, we're probably not all experts on surrealism and surrealists, but, and although that's tied more to the avant-garde move, movement in art and literature, the premise is really sought to release that creative potential of the unconscious mind. So, I mean, I've got a quote up here uh, from Dali. Surrealism is destructive, but it destroys only what is considered to be shackles limiting our vision. And when you think about that, and we look at the quote from our CEO, Mark Benioff, that you need to have a beginner's mindset to create bold innovation. So really one and the same. I think about when I look at my child and, I, and as they grow and they develop and they're always asking, what's this, what's that, what's that? I, it's like, stop asking questions. But you think about as we mature and we get older, we start to lean on our experience, our knowledge. We, we don't seek out that education. And I think that's really connecting this through this lens of we've got to continue to tap into our unconscious mind to create that innovation. Stop leaning on our experience, but start to look toward new experiences to drive that innovation. Approach everything with a, a deep beginner's mindset. And in our particular role, it's vastly critical. When we're having conversations with customers, it's so important to go in there. How do you do this? What do you do that? No assumptions are made when we're having conversations about their business processes, their challenge. We continue to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into how they do things, what they do, and ultimately why they do it that way so that we can come with a very prescriptive and specific solution in our particular role in our organization. If I could just chime in there, Riley. Of course, we have one large module on surrealism and innovation and DALI and connecting that. And some of the students have asked questions. Well, how, they may not see the connection. And I like the idea that you brought up this beginner's mindset. I like the idea of untapping this creative uh, potential, but also the idea that uh, of this unconsciousness. And, and the reason why I'm not suggesting innovation is unconscious, but what I am suggesting is there is a dilemma that firms are facing. These old paradoxes of thinking, these old uh, legacy perspectives, processes, management styles and structures, and maybe the unconscious of what surrealism offers is this reshaping of that paradigm to try different things, to mash up, to make connections that are outside of that paradigm of thought. And largely that is where the, lar the discussion is happening in terms of innovation. How can we rearrange structures, networks, value chains, supply chains, different ways that may be counterintuitive to those legacy 
paradigms that exist in the organizations and the firms and process and, and even mindsets that we have that could unlock new values, new ways of thinking and seeing and creating value. So, for instance, while I'm not suggesting this is surrealism, but it may be very paradoxical to give free products away. But we see that as being a business model for many companies, Spotify, even giving away Amazon Prime at a discount. So you spent more money later on because people who have a prime want their two day shipping or to spend money. So there are these, this paradox that companies are using that wouldn't necessarily fit this traditional financial analysis, operational analysis, but it's able to create value different ways and at an exponential rate. And the beginner mindset to discover of uh, your client and the problems are a wonderful way of reshaping that as well. This paradox, opposed to being, I'm an expert, the client needs to learn what I know, but a different approach. And the same thing goes for internal solutions. So thank you for making that connection. I wanted to bridge that because there were some students struggling to, you know, and I'm not a surrealist expert. We're just trying to make analogies to help us understand this complex concept and construct of innovation. Back to you, Riley. Thanks, Stephen. I'll, I'll pause there. Any any questions, thoughts, comments from the, from the group on this piece? All right. Well, let me ask them if, if after they reviewed the innovation or the DALI module, was there things that provoked them to think differently or to do a deeper dive into how it relates to innovation or their firm or maybe what resulted from having this tapa of surrealism in a course of innovation, in a course of business. Any thoughts? There's no wrong answer. Cool, yes. Hi, this is Nicole. Good morning, everyone. I think that when I was going through the module, um, I've been in management for quite a few years, and I do find that, um, you know, we have our processes and policies, you know, because the top of the food chain really structures that for us. I think this module has actually um, helped me, even though I may not be able to break through the vision of the top of the food chain, but it helps me to see that I can think differently. I can feel comfort in that. Um, and then also in my approach and how I share that with my leadership. So I, I thought the creative thinking and the kind of flexing that muscle came from this module. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Awesome. That's great to hear, Nicole. <clears throat> I can empathize with that, having been in commercial real estate for 10 years and a very legacy and old school mindset, everything top down, um, very restricted at the individual level to, uh, to to innovate, you know, in any regard. And then even communicate that up was it usually didn't make it past the first level. So. So um, if I, may I speak? Go ahead, Jim. So for me, I'm, I'm also in um, commercial property management. Um, I work directly for the owner of the properties. He, so he owns, you know, these large shopping centers. Um, it's a family owned kind of thing. So where I think I've gotten lucky in my professional career is that like I'm the only person that works for him in the in the office. So I get to make all the decisions. And so, you know, um, it's very rare. I mean, I've been working for him for 20 something years now. So it's very rare that I have to call him for anything, you know, and, and a lot of times when I call him, it's like, hey, where are you? Well, where are you on the boat? Or are you in town or are you, you know, sailing the ocean? <laughs> you know, so I think I've been very blessed in that, that I, when I see something that needs to be changed or I see a better way to do something that I have the freedom to, to make those, to, to make those choices myself. So I'm, I'm so thankful for that um, in this position that I have now. That's awesome to hear. And when you have that connection and that, that closeness, right? It's a small organization. You're typically afforded the, the autonomy uh, to do so. But, uh, you know, Salesforce being a 60,000 plus employee company, those organizations uh, don't typically promote innovation from the bottom up. But I'd love to jump with that into kind of how we do that from the bottom up. So really Salesforce is a platform for innovation. And we use this slide to communicate our platform from a product standpoint and technology standpoint 
but really taking a step to use this to communicate how Salesforce thinks about innovation. And it really starts with our core values of trust, customer success, innovation, and equality. And when we think of values in the organizations that we, we are with or we've been with, you can really, you know, there's a, there's a wide spectrum there in terms of are they words on a wall? Or are they actually embraced and embodied every day by the leaders, by the managers, by the team members? And really at Salesforce, we do. And we, we embrace this through tying these to our KPIs and our, our Ohana. And we've gone away from using the word Ohana to be a little bit more politically correct in these times, but for purposes of day, I still like to, to use it to embrace that body of family that we really uh, focus on the wellness and well being of our company, not just from a business perspective, but a personal perspective, from a community perspective. What are we doing beyond just the business? How are we being a leader and innovative and using business as a platform for change in our society? And when we look at it, we're tied from a KPI perspective, and I'm gonna double click into this in a minute, in terms of teamwork, innovation, mindful operator, and above and beyond. So we're comp directly on innovation itself and how we are doing that. Again, I'll double click into that in a minute. <clears throat> and on top of that are our products. So it really starts with our value, our people, and then it comes up, and then we're, then we're into products. And we're continually innovating our products. We have three major releases a year. We're always thinking ahead. We're always acquiring companies, again, continuing to innovate, whether it's internally or through acquisition or through. So that represents the Salesforce organization. But because Salesforce is an open source product, we really rely on our developers, our app exchange, and those that have the, the, school, the skills and the tool set to develop on our platform. And this is a significant competitive advantage because we can only innovate and scale and grow so much internally doing this all on our own R&D dollars and with our own R&D team. But because we extend this to our Salesforce community and developers, we have the huge Trailblazer community out there. We have free education around Trailhead. Every individual is empowered to learn the tool, develop on the platform, and even potentially leverage this from a business perspective, meaning they can uh, develop a product, whether it's a business card scanner on our platform, all the way to a complex supply chain management solution, to travel and logistics solutions, and everything across the spectrum that you could imagine. We've got over 5,000 different applications that are plug and play into Salesforce. So you as a customer can tap into this. So when you think about scalability from a business perspective, if you've got a solution that you need, you can deploy that rather quickly rather than spending days, hours, months, years developing this and it not being flexible, not being on a platform that's continually innovating underneath itself. So the value here for Salesforce is because we've extended this open source mindset and innovation out to the entire world, basically, because anybody can access this, we can scale, grow, and continue to lead in our space as we uh, as we move forward. And it's key, speed and technology. I mean, we think about the iPhone being invented just 13 years ago is like crazy. Uh, and now technology just consumes our life from every angle and aspect. But that really represents the Salesforce ecos Salesforce organization, then the Salesforce ego sits on top of that. But it's really this flywheel effect that we're able to create with our customers and drive that customer success through innovating across our people, our leaders, our executives, through our partners, our developers, and our entire Salesforce community ultimately drives that customer success. And they have a huge stake in the development of our products. We pull our customers all the time. We're looking for ideas. There's an idea exchange out there. We're always taking those into account when we're deploying releases, updating, and innovating. So it really ultimately is this massive ecosystem across the entire globe that allows us to innovate but it's really starts at that core of innovation as a value, innovation as a KPI, and innovation, again, bottom up and top down. Riley, can I chime in right there? Yes, I'm so, pausing. Um, Riley has just gone over, could be possibly 20 to 25 different concepts in how Salesforce utilizes the same concepts we talk about in our class. These should be pinging us regularly, of course, He's not just talking about broadly innovation. He's talking about even the tools and techniques and how they're connected in terms of being measurable, 
uh, with KPIs, how that's layered over the values. So innovation being a value, then the KPIs and how he's, you know, people are comped or um, the role of community and what they call Ohana, the you know, products, how they're tested, the cr value created from the ecosystem, the platform exchange, the two-sidedness, then being able to prototype and test right away using these communities that they've developed. So these are, this is a wonderful example uh, and Riley's gone through several wonderful examples of how the concepts we're covering are applying to uh, Salesforce and how they're using them in their, their different businesses and how people at all levels of the organization can potentially tap in or help uh, be innovative or the, the processes and, and accesses that they have to be innovative. And maybe you want to also think in your firms, how can you be more of an ecosystem? How can you utilize a platform? or double-sided, or can you cultivate a community where you're able to potentially test things or get ideas from? And these are all small steps. And of course it's tied to at Salesforce, these values of the culture, which is why we introduced that improv for business class as a culture building uh, course. Back to you, Riley. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. I'll pause there and actually, I wanna do two, two things. I wanna say from a scale of one to five, cause you can use one hand and I can see everybody. How innovative do you think your organization is? I'm gonna, I, I hate teams because you can't see my video, but I'm going to just say five. I see a three. I see a four. I see a four, four. I see a one. All right, Jeff. Unfortunately, you just fallen told yourself. So why, why do you think uh, you're, and I don't know what anybody does here except Jen, because she told me what she does. Um, but I'd love to understand, you know, why you really think it's a, it's a one and what could be different there. And you're on mute. That mute gets me every time. So I'll preface with, I work for Duke Energy Electric Utility Company. And um, just, I guess one of the reasons why I think that we are just not very innovative is because we've been doing things, I know at least at my level, um, the same way for a very long time. There's a ton of low hanging fruit in all of our processes and kind of in my roles as, as different leadership or in different leadership positions. I've been moved around a lot and uh, I get to really see that. And it seems like, you know, when you get moved into a new organization and you look at a process that is so cumbersome and requires so much input from the whole team. And then you ask the question, you know, why are we doing it this way? And the answer you always get is, well, that's just the, the way we've always done it. And a lot of times what I find out is, you know, people are really passionate about those uninnovative processes because they might have been, you know, uh, maybe have been had some stake in that in the past, or maybe have been the ones that came up with that idea. And so that's something that I always try to look at is, you know, how to how to convince and persuade others into looking at new ideas and processes. And, and I guess really any suggestions that you have there, I would I would love to know how to be more innovative at my level. And really, I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head with uh, when you started out with you know, the traditional top down mindset. And it is it's hard to to create and induce innovation at my level, I feel like in my organization. Yeah, I completely empathize with you. As you said, Duke Energy, <clears throat> Tico Energy is one of uh, our customers and our patches, or at least one that we pursued. Uh, and it's it's different in that utilities and energy space. It is a legacy mindset. We, we uh, responded to a thirty five hundred question RFP and it was around, you know, how they're um, servicing their customers, how they're working on their projects, how they're going to market from a field service perspective and uh, rather cumbersome um, and rather uninnovative. Un um, I, <laughs> I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer in my response there. I think it, you know, it's hard. I'll open it up to those that maybe gave a four and a five and uh, you know, how are you doing it differently? How are you, you know, more of an individual or you know, first line leader level? Uh, and maybe we have, folks on the line that are that are higher than that innovating at uh, at your level so i think uh i'm gonna call him michael i think michael threw it before did i see a four mike yeah i definitely did not throw it before but i'll, uh, oh. I'll chime in here so i uh similar to jeff but um i i'd say i'm actually even further down the list uh, i work for local government and boy there is so much uh I, you know I, I want to say misunderstood or uneducated people about what they think uh, local state statutes and policies and elected commissioners can and can't do. And uh, most of it is nine times out of 10, I think it's just a misunderstanding. But 
you know, I've worked for private organizations before I joined the public sector and my previous employer, uh, the CEO got in front of one of our town hall meetings that they would do quarterly and said, all right, everybody, we're going to focus on innovation. And they rolled out this, it was like a 35,000 employee company. And they rolled out a, like an interactive web page on the team's internal website where people could promote ideas and then people could vote on the good ideas that they liked. And then the company would invest resources into the really highly voted ideas. And that, um, you know, just as from an observation level worked out really, really well, but kind of to your point and what Jeff mentioned just a moment ago, I mean, it's got to be from the top down. You got to have the leadership be willing to invest uh, time and resources into it. Otherwise, these these ideas kind of just die, you know, fizzle out after, uh, you know, like if middle management or somebody, you know, brings up some ideas and then they just kind of get lost in space. Yeah, and I think that we may be able to all agree as we move toward this, uh, you know, this technological revolution and this more innovative mindset, this open source of, of thinking and design thinking and the classes like Dr. D's teaching and this is becoming mainstream across MBA programs in terms of innovation. I think you're going to get, you're going to see employees leave these organizations. These co companies are going to get left behind. I use my experience in commercial real estate. And one of the biggest things, one of the biggest reasons I came back and got my MBA is because I knew I was going to a want to, but b have to pivot in my career just because of the legacy mindset that existed at these organizations. You're talking fortune, you know, 500 companies, fortune 100 in Simon's case, leading uh, real estate developer in the world still, using legacy technology, using legacy processes, not willing to innovate. Um, and it's frustrating, especially as you know, young, I don't care whether you're young or old, you know, if you have more of that innovative mindset to be in an organization that pigeonholes you uh, from sharing ideas. So that was a big premise for me getting my MBA. Don't know what everybody else is, but uh, I leveraged that. I considered invaluable. I absolutely got my ROI. So when people are like, oh, is your MBA paying for itself? I'm like, oh, like tenfold over already. So. Thank you, USF. Wonderful. Uh, so I wanted to double click into you know, the values and really the Ohana and how we align innovation as a KPI. So we, every quarter, have to go back and either think about this, right, do a write-up on each one of these, these verticals and what we contributed from an innovation, Ohana perspective, being a mindful operator, running, you know, we're in a sales organization, so we do have to run this like a business, uh, and what we're doing externally above you know, above and beyond, you know, what are we doing from a community standpoint? What are we doing from a volunteering standpoint? How are we helping our team? Uh, big, uh, big, just big here in terms of driving innovation at the individual level. And when we think about individual, this can be technology at its most fundamental uh, roots for Salesforce, a technology company. There's a ton of ways to get involved in uh, Innovating from you know product standpoint, if you're on that side in your development or idea sourcing or idea uh, crowdsourcing from from the team, creating individual projects to to work on technology. But then even above and beyond that, processes. You know, some of us think you know aren't developers in in Salesforce, and we think about how do we retool our processes? How do we do things different? How do we approach customers differently? How do we come with different uh, um, different thoughts, mindset, the way we run meetings, uh, the way we approach uh, team meetings, uh, anything around process could be uh, could be uh, innovative. And then people, how are we innovating ourselves? How are we developing ourselves? We have so many programs out there. The the uh, the personal development that happens at Salesforce, you have so much of it. Access to anything and everything. Corn Ferries running uh, personal development half day workshops. You've got trailheads. You've got uh, product enablement. I mean, it is just coming at you from every angle. I laugh that I get at least eight hours worth of invites to uh, enablement every week on my calendar. So uh, it's right there. But the, the point here is innovation doesn't necessarily just have to be technology or in, from the business standpoint. It can be innovating processes. It can be innovating people, your team. It can be innovating yourself, right? And that's what we're all doing here. What we've all doing through the MBA program is in hopes of innovating ourselves, getting us to think differently, adding to our skill set and tool set. And I will leave you with this. <clears throat> One of the biggest takeaways I had in my MBA program was, listen, I spent money, we're all spending money on this. We, we're doing this for our 
whatever reason you guys have, mine was a make a career pivot and B I had a, um, I had an advisor in undergrad that really pissed me off and I had a chip on my shoulder when she said I'd never get into a master's program. So maybe somebody has got a family member or someone that's, uh, you know, they're kind of doing this in spite of, but nonetheless, uh, in, you know, innovating yourself here uh, is, is key. But the premise is MBA, an MBA program is the median to educate yourself, to come with that beginner's mindset, to tap into that unconsciousness and break the mold of uh, the status quo, but you can use any median and don't stop doing that. Don't stop educating yourself. Don't stop learning after you get out of this program, find another medium, whether it's a certificate program, whether it's internal enablement or training, whether it's going to a conference, two day workshop, whatever it is, don't stop learning. And that's what I tell their folks that maybe aren't interested in an MBA program, don't have the money. There's plenty of stuff out there that is cheap or free that can lead to, uh, you know, a more fruitful career or a different uh, industry for you. So I'll pause there. All right, that's all I got, Dr. D. Wonderful. Uh, let's uh, see if you can, wonderful. Now we can see you or what well, we can see the, you wanna turn on your camera, wonderful. Uh, Riley, that was excellent. The reason why I think that was excellent, one, one, you're coming back to our class to share your experiences, but two, I, I would like to just pull a few things apart to, to demonstrate that maybe not completely answer, but partly answer maybe Jeff or Mike. How do we do it? How do we get empowered to do it? And, and like I said, there's a, a lot of misconceptions about entrepreneurship and innovation, but being an innovator is not easy. So you're like, you're, you remember, you are against the world. You're against these legacy mindset, the organization structures, processes. So how can we take steps to potentially have influence for innovation in our own situation? So the idea of community or maybe even file, finding some like-minded people to test a different process. So then that's tied to community, that's tied to potentially prototype, it's tied to getting these small wins and then identifying the KPIs that you can go back to a senior boss or your boss to say, look at what we did differently and the results. Maybe we can deploy this differently or try or have some separate processes. So these are small steps that you can do. It's not gonna be easy. No one said being an innovator was easy. No one said that you know, fighting the, the big behemoth is easy. That's, that's the famous story, right? At least tied to the biblical one. But these are the small steps we need to do if we need to make change or we can need to indoctrinate them or have them be trained and understand the differences, nuances and what's available. Um, but I would like to kind of dissect one of them. I know Salesforce was uh, utilizing innovation contests called the Dream Pitch. And this is one tool that we do talk about in class. And it could be one of the easy tools for you to utilize to start testing the waters in your space. How does Salesforce use Dream Pitch uh, as an innovation contest internally? And, and maybe we can see if we can connect it to our own firms and situations. Yeah, absolutely. So what Dream Pitch is, this is the third iteration of it at Salesforce, and it's geared toward the solutions engineering team in a mayor. So there's about 800 solutions engineers. You can go through an application process. They select five cohorts of six people. You're paired with a, a coach who's more of an executive leader, and you're tasked with this challenge that's presented, that's formulated by the executive leadership team or, you know, level two, level three. Uh, and they, they vary. This year is around our specializations organization. I'm not going to get into the details there, but last year it was about diversity, equality, inclusion. How do we, you know, take steps forward there and innovate that? So the challenge always changes. It's very ambiguous and vague. Uh, so there's a myriad of ways you can approach the, the challenge to do discovery around it, to solution around it. Uh, and ultimately, there'll be a, a presentation and a read back to the executive team where we get the pitch for about 10 to 15 minutes. But I think it's an interesting concept. Obviously, you know, we embrace and, and uh, embody innovation top down, bottom up and all throughout the organization. So this is just common practice for us to have something like this. But I think about it in the context of those organizations that may be less innovative and it's you know, aligning with like-minded people, like crafting this internally. I mean, obviously you've got to have management buy-in. I've worked for managers where if you aren't doing your day job, they you know slap you on the hand 
send you a nice little nasty gram over email, probably write you up too, uh, if you weren't doing your, your role that was in focus and scope. So it depends on how much autonomy or flexibility you have. I think getting buy-in from leadership, getting that sponsorship, maybe finding like-minded people, uh, and maybe it's developing kind of a, a solution or a problem. I think Jeff, you know, you mentioned it. Maybe it's like kind of aggregating those those folks that you know want to be innovative. What's the problem you're trying to solve for? Um, you know, digging in, uh, make it a side project, I guess, if you will, <clears throat> and and think and craft a solution. And you know, it may land on deaf ears. It may not. It may get you on the radar. It may be a blip. Uh, it may open to your eyes to hey this might not be the right company or the right industry or the right place for me. Maybe I need to go explore. Listen, life is short. I was not going to spend 10 years in, in real estate anymore. It wasn't, you know, I had a good run. I enjoyed it while I was there, but I needed to pivot. I wasn't afraid to, uh, was it a massive reset in terms of, uh, learning and starting from zero basically again? Sure. But I'm much happier two years into this role than I would have been continuing two years in my previous role. So, Again, it's an approach. You can take that dream pitch approach, get like-minded people, kind of get a cohort together, start to solve for something. You know, if it continues to land on deaf ears and innovation is truly important, something you embody and embrace, then I, I hate to say, maybe it's worth exploring something else. But that's the cold, hard truth. Thank you, Riley, for that. I want to pivot just a bit because not only do we want to learn about innovation, but we also want to grow we're here as an MBA, MBA students and master's students. And so my question to you, Riley, because you were clear in your, during your, your uh, speech that your ROI is off the charts or you've exceeded your ROI or whatever the question is in terms of the MBA. How do other MBA students or master's students who are taking this class ensure that they are excelling or having return on investment greater than what they expected or, you know, what, what advice would you have for them? And, and how did you maximize that? I know you have a wonderful story in terms of how you pivoted, but maybe you can give us some ideas of how to make sure we utilize what we're learning. Yeah, I think it gave, it, it powered me a lot to make that pivot in the industry because when I came to Salesforce and I'm in what is considered more technical role, although, we do a lot of selling. It's about a 50, 50 split, uh, went through the interview, the presentation or went through the interviews, had a great alignment with the, the three or four folks I interviewed with, went to a panel presentation, uh, that included the VP of our, uh, our org. And the, that was on a Friday. And this is a, like, I've never had anxiety. I'm a pretty even killed person, but talk to my hiring manager. He's like, Hey, we love you, but the VPs just hung up. Do you have the technical acumen? Monday comes along. I'm like, I got my heart's racing, like got anxiety I've never had before. I'm having a meeting with him tonight. He's, uh, I'll, I'll try to pitch you then. Tuesday comes around, I get a call from a recruiter. Hey, this Sam, the VP wants to talk to you. And I'm like, how do I get something on Sam? Like, I can't speak to background I don't have. I can speak to my strengths. I can't speak to my you know, weaknesses. I can lean on this and say, I've, I've sales. I got an MBA, I, I can learn. That's what I did in that. I dug in, I got some info on him. I found a sweet little nugget where he's like, we should think about hiring different individuals with different backgrounds. I mean, it was gold when I went into this conversation, but I also leaned on my MBA. I said, listen, I got an MBA 10 years removed from school. Yeah, I completed that as a working professional. I have a desire to learn. I'm gonna learn. I will shorten the learning curve from a technology perspective because I'm gonna dig in, I'm gonna work hard. I'm gonna learn it. But that's, and I think that everybody who signs up for an MBA and strives to do well here, I'm, I'm going to guess we're all spending our own money uh, or we have loans or whatever. Nobody's parents are writing a check probably at this point, maybe, maybe one or two, which would still be nice. But um, I think that's what I leaned on. I said, hey, I've got a ton of business acumen. I can probably help out those that don't have the sales acumen or the business acumen that, that are in this role. I can learn the techno the technology. It's not an issue. You guys promote it as click snack code. It's easy. Everybody can do it. So um, that's what I leaned on. It was really what I learned in my MBA program. I applied it. I used it. A little, I don't want to say as a crutch, but as a stepping stone to say, I, mean, I got a chip in the game here that other people don't. So, and you guys are all going to have that. Great example. Wonderful. 
I mean, that's a big step to go from one industry to another after you've already laid the drop groundwork for so long in one industry. And that's a lot of what a lot of MBAs do is try to pivot. And maybe some of you guys can relate to this and, and who knows where the careers go and who knows what happens in industries. But I'd like to open the floor for questions. Um, of course, we have I have many other questions for Riley, but maybe you guys have questions and maybe you guys have insights or, or directions we want to take this conversation. So if you have a question, raise your hand virtually in real life and let's shoot. Don't be shy. I have a question. We talked about learning. And, you know, I know you guys are spending your hard earned money and to get your MBA and maybe you guys had a different approach in your undergrad. But one thing that we teach, at least in my classes, is the idea of. Of this lifelong learner or the learning organization. I'm curious to know if learning has changed or if the role of learning for you as you either pivoted from the real estate to Salesforce or now you're in a different career trajectory. What role does learning play and how do you continuously learn or reinvent yourself? Because we all get stale. I, I would say first and foremost, I'm fortunate to be an organization that has so many avenues and mediums and opportunities to develop personally, develop from a leadership perspective, develop teaming skills, product skills. Uh, but it's about that cadence. And we, we internally, we, we get so busy sometimes, you kind of got to build it into your week, build it into your day, block off an hour or two, um, look for other programs. I took the free certificate program that USF offered around um, diversity, equality, inclusion. I thought it was um, pretty impactful and powerful. It's just, you know, our world's changing, especially from that perspective. And I think it's important to, to skill up in that regard. And I don't think that's going to stop. And when you look at that approaching business with a beginner's mindset, like if you come with those skills and you want to level up and move up, they're going to be invaluable when you become a you know manager. You know, I think about being a VP or an SVP, you know, you start to get three, four, five levels up. All that knowledge that you've consumed over those years because you just kept it as a cadence. You've never gotten stale. You've found something else to learn, something to do, that's something that's applicable uh, is, uh, is invaluable. But I think you've all taken that step of into the MBA program. This was uh, your self-choice. Continue to make that a self-choice um, around learning. Don't stop here. So the one last question, if there's any, if there's not any questions from from the, the group. I'll take a Salesforce specific question too. If you, you want you want to take a sales. Yeah, if you got like anybody has a something's burning top of mind. Yeah, so, um, so I actually have a quick question. Uh, bear with me. Sorry, I'm having like terrible coughing fits. Um, but I currently work for Verizon and uh, I'm a financial analyst, so I'm, I'm starting out. Uh, you know, bottom, bottom of the barrel, um, but I'm a part of a leadership development program. And so like oftentimes these topics are always flooded in our day to day because of course Verizon wants us to innovate and, and be better and, and think better and, you know, just make change in the organization. Um, but I think one of the hardest connections I have is as a future leader, what is one of the things um, we can do to ensure that we are kind of staying up with change and innovation and encouraging our teammates to do the same and also kind of you know keep the morale going and kind of corral everybody to constantly have that motivation Ooh, that's a really good one so let me give that a, a little bit of thought i'm in a similar program right now uh it's a year-long leadership program uh, at Salesforce, but you know, being a team lead, I think you have to understand and you have to get to know your people and understand that everybody has different motivations and different motivations at any point in time. I mean, we have to remember we all have personal lives. You know, I might be like super thrilled that I'm getting married and 
that's what's on my mind and I'm ready to buy a house, but you know what, my mom dies and all of a sudden that just goes, you know, off the rails. And now I'm just focused on like, how do I like keep my mental health going and, you know, deal with my mom dying. So I think it's just understanding your people, <clears throat> taking a very empathetic mindset when having conversations, leading with, you know, empathy, being vulnerable yourself, um, you know, sharing things that are going on with you personally and build that trust with them. <clears throat> and then, you know, ask them. I have, you know, the the people that I lead, I have them fill out a sheet. I, I lead with saying, here's, here's my sheet, but it's a lot of stuff around how do you operate? What motivates you? You know, what gets you out of bed? What gets you excited? What frustrates you? What What's your pet peeve? One of my biggest pet peeves is people showing up late for meetings. And in this virtual world, it's frustrating because they're back to back to back. So I've got to be a little forgive, forgiving. But I think that helps, you know, being open, transparent, honest yourself. I think it's the flywheel effect of reciprocation as time goes on. But just be empathetic. I mean, you never know what people are going through personally. Biggest piece of advice I can give leading people. But In fact, I think that was a great answer. In fact, one of the themes in the Improv to Business course is empathy and awareness, accepting and giving. So we ask about how do we make change in an organization and, and building that culture. And it's through these soft skills, through these soft tools that can help us start building this continue and continually build this foundation of, of, of an innovative culture or an openness culture or an inclusive culture. So wonderful reply and, and foundation. Any other questions you guys have for Riley? I have one more, but uh, I know you guys are curious and, and talented and brilliant. So we would like to hear from you. Can I put, can I put Mr. Dyer on the spot? <laughs> Certainly. Well, I, I am I am taking all of this in. This is really good. So thank you, Riley. Um, do appreciate it. Um, we're in I'm in um, a, a financial services industry, but we're essentially a technology shop. Um, we offer credit debit processing solutions for credit unions. Um, and I think as an organization, we strive to be innovative. However, I mean, it's pushed down from the top. However, we're so uh, uh, concerned about risk of pursuing something that may be innovative that a lot of these innovative ideas get squashed pretty quickly. Um, and that can be that can be discouraging. And especially when you're part of a team, I've been part of a couple of teams that have tried to put together some solutions. I'm I'm in IT, by the way. So uh, I, uh, I've been a part of a couple of hackathons, if you will, and we've come up with solutions that really didn't go anywhere, at least not initially. And then a few years down the road, the risk tolerance is a little bit, I guess, higher at that point, and that gets picked up and there's someone else gets credit for it <laughs> or someone else just co-ops the idea and runs with it or there's political discussions involved and one one department gets ownership of it uh rather than the other so i, I would say that like as an organization we're fairly innovative but it's really hard to make any splash whatsoever and it's really hard to, to kind of get any kind of credit uh, uh for and your input. So I think that can be a little bit uh, uh, defeating, especially when you're trying to really push innovation at, a, at an organizational level. Yeah, uh, it, it can absolutely be tough. And going through, you know, the dream pitch solutioning program that I'm going through, you know, called a hackathon as well. May I ask where you where you work? If you can share it. Oh. Yes, yes, it's PSU. And I believe we are a Salesforce shop too. Okay. So the biggest thing that you got to, I think we all, you got to remember at the top, at the top or whoever you're pitching it to is like, you're going to have to formulate a business case and it's going to have to be very specific, very financially driven around whatever solution you're proposing. Um, and hopefully you can, you know, I think if you've got the access to the financial information or the metrics and you can quantify it and you can find an area to focus on where you can move the needle. And then you kind of start to solution from there. They kind of come, they kind of converge together. Um, but what's, 
you know, high lift, high, what's high lift, high impact, low lift, low, I mean, you know, kind of put it into four boxes and look for those things that are high impact, low lift, can have an immediate financial return. Yeah, and you probably, and I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but that's the biggest thing we're focused on in, you know, our hackathon, if you will, is what's that, what's the measure, what's a quantifiable measure and what data points are we using to drive that? Not just saying, hey, we've got this solution, it's going to be a $3 million return if we invest 300,000. Like saying, hey, I've got this quantified measure that impacts this, that impacts this. And, and then we do some math and we've got like, here is, this is a very tight number here that we can impact um, based on the data that we know we have. And then I think you start to get a little bit more buy and people start to like, okay, let me, let me double click into that solution a little bit. Are these numbers tight? Yeah, they look good. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, let's explore this. Because they're going to first go to, okay, What's the what's the financial return? What's the financial impact? Is it real or is it just you know you're pulling numbers arbitrarily out of the sky? So I don't know if that answers a question, but no, it, it it does, and I think that's probably where we were the weakest was selling the the idea. The solution was there at least from a technical perspective, but yeah, we didn't do a good job of selling it and you know basically creating the story around why this would be good for the organization. So thank you. We'll definitely dive more into some of these tools and exactly what you said, storytelling, building awareness or persuasion, empathy. All of these are thematic based in the Improv to Business course. So I'd like to give Riley the last uh, word before we wrap up. And I always ask all the guests on the Open Educator community this. If you could go back to your younger self, what advice would you give him? I think you're on mute, Riley. I said, let me let me give that a, a little bit of thought, but I mean, am I a certain age? Because that, that could impact it. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, I think, oh God. I'm gonna give myself. See, Sienna, I sent this over to you. I swear I did, didn't I? Um. Yeah, you did one. I had a good one, um, okay. I don't want to miss this because I think it was super valuable. Uh, and I, okay, it was, it kind of alludes to back what I talked to throughout this presentation was just never stop innovating yourself. I think that early in my career, I kind of, you know, you get out of undergrad, you're like, okay, I'm in a career, I'm just going to work and then I'm going to get promoted and I'm going to work harder and I'm going to get promoted. And then you like all of a sudden find yourself just stuck in the same repetitive motion day in and day out. Um, and listen, there's a lot of things that happen externally that influence like, you know, your your day to day. But I'm not a creature of habit. I think humans naturally are, and they get into this motion. It's repeatable. It's the same. I'm always open minded, very fluid with how I operate. Doesn't mean I miss details and things like that. But <clears throat> say yes to things. Don't say no. Be open minded to saying yes. Be the yes man. I always like that movie. Um, try it out for a day. I don't know. Don't get hurt doing it, but just never stop innovating yourself. I think that's my biggest takeaway. It was the biggest thing I learned out of the MBA program. Find ways to learn, find mediums to educate yourself, develop personally and professionally. God knows I could do a little bit better on the personal front if you ask my wife, but um, I digress. <laughs> Thank you. So let's give Riley a big round of applause. Yes, and is actually one of the tools we learn at improv uh to business class how we build off of people's ideas we accept it we don't reject it so you could see riley utilizing that right there and in, in his wisdom and advice so riley i can't thank you enough for spending this saturday morning with us uh coming back and constantly making the usf mba program better uh hopefully this is a call to action to the current mbas and and, and they come back and share their stories and wisdom and remember reach out to riley Riley, do you have an email or direction how they can reach out to you? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. I try to avoid the other social media outlets. I'm not a YouTube star, Dr. Day, sorry. Uh, anyway, LinkedIn is easy. might be soon. Right? <laughs> Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, so, everyone. Riley, a big round of applause. And I will be in touch with you shortly.